Welcome to Discovering. Arctic grayling disappeared from Michigan's waters in the 1930s. They could be making a comeback in hopes that someday young fishermen like this little guy can put one on the end of a line. Everybody's just really uh, excited about this project getting started. And we're back with the Beatty Knot Great Lakes Sport Fishermen as their young walleyes are introduced to Lake Michigan. Stick around, it's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill Soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Arctic grayling, most recognized by their sail like dorsal fin, died out in Michigan in the 1930s, but now could be making a comeback. Early logging practices destroyed grayling habitat by killing vegetation and ruining stream beds. Additionally, overfishing played a major role in their demise. When grayling began to become scarce, Michigan brought in other fish to satisfy the sport and commercial fishing markets. Fish like brown trout, brook trout, and steelhead were stocked. Coho salmon were stocked in the 1960s. Competition from those species, along with today's changing habitat, presents a variety of obstacles for grayling. A group made up of 45 partners, called the Michigan Grayling Initiative, began work several years ago in an effort to bring grayling back to Michigan's waters. I was in Marquette as the fish arrived at the Marquette State Fish Hatchery for their first taste of UP water. So uh, we're really excited here at uh, Marquette Hatchery to be receiving the, the Arctic grayling yearlings. Uh, this is a program the state's uh, started a couple of years ago and these are the first fish uh, to come to Marquette uh, and they're going to become our food in the, in the future. The basis of this project is to rear broodstock here and then we'll start producing eggs when these fish mature and those eggs are going to go out to uh, on-site stream incubators uh, where the fish will hatch right into the, right into the stream. And then there's a long-term research project to sort of track the success of this program. It's going to be probably 10 years before we get a, a good feel for whether this program is going to work. But we have more optimism that this strategy will work uh, based on what they've learned out west uh, than the old strategy, which is stocking older fish. So we're really optimistic and uh, we're really uh, uh, pleased and happy that, uh, to be part of this program. There's, there's a ton of excitement in, in both in the public and the sports groups and, and everybody's just really uh, excited about this project getting started. Michigan's got, oh gosh, close to th around, well, let's say about 30,000 miles of cold water stream habitat. Grayling were the only uh, native stream fish in basically all the cold water streams in the uh, so almost the entire lower peninsula. If there's a cold water stream uh, that had salmonids in it, it would be grayling. Uh, brown trout were introduced. We didn't have any of this chinook, coho, salmon, steelhead. Those didn't exist at the time. And brook trout were limited to streams just in the upper northern edge of the lower peninsula. And um, we think that these, the juvenile size of trout might be the, a really important one because they're very abundant in streams and those newly hatched grayling fry will be a very tasty morsel uh, for them. And we have a limited number of grayling and a limited number of grayling eggs, so we can only try the reintroductions in a very, very small portion of those waters. Um, so part of our research is to identify or develop a, a way to uh, winnow out all the miles and get down to areas where we think are most suitable. Our ultimate intent is to have these young grayling that are introduced through the stream side rearing process survive 
and then naturally reproduce in those streams. That's what we're really shooting for. So, The future is these fish are probably going to go, most of them initially, to the Manistee River system because that was the, that was the site that we know was historically good grayling habitat back when, when grayling were native in Michigan. Uh, if it works there, I think there's plans to probably expand it to, to other watersheds. Uh, but the initial period of stocking is really uh, an evaluation phase. So uh, we don't know all the things that we need to know about how to make this program work. As we stock, we're going to be evaluating success and determining, you know, if the, if the sites that we initially selected were good, we'll probably continue. If they don't, we'll probably look for for other sites, but we're expecting, you know, information in the next five to ten years to sort of guide the, the development of this project and sort of guide our, our strategy moving forward. This is really started as a partnership with the Little River Band of Ottawa Indian Tribe. Uh, they're located down in, um, in Manistee. Uh, Arctic grayling have uh, really high significant uh, cultural significance for a lot of the tribes and so they approached us about a partnership with uh, developing a, an Arctic grayling reintroduction effort and of course we were interested and excited to be to join and be part of it but since then it's grown into a, a much bigger or much broader uh, coalition. We've got universities that are helping with research. We've got philanthropies that are donating money to, to support this program. Uh, we have many sports groups uh, that, are, that are supportive of this program. So we're, we're in the infancy, but there's a lot of excitement around the state uh, about getting this, this program off the ground and, and started. So it started for us probably three years ago. The eggs uh, for this group of fish that are just coming here today uh, were spawned up in Alaska in uh, the spring of 2019. So the spring before this past spring, uh, two of our staff here at Market Hatchery and, and two staff of ours in fisheries division from Lansing went up to Alaska uh, to help uh, collect these eggs. Uh, they spawned them in the wild. These, are, these fish come from the Chena River, which is a tributary to the Yukon River in, in central Alaska. Uh, they brought the eggs back, and because they're coming from outside the Great Lakes Basin, there's always a concern about introduction of pathogens. So we couldn't bring those eggs directly to the hatchery. Uh, we had to hold them in quarantine at Michigan State University for six months so that they could pass uh, a fish health exam. And once they were cleared, we transferred those fingerlings up to our Odin hatchery in Petoskey. Uh, and they've been in isolation there for the last uh, 12 months. And during those 18 months, they go through three uh, fish health exams. The good news is they passed all their exams and they're gonna stay here until they're old enough to start producing eggs. This is a beginning of a long-term effort, but uh, the Arctic grayling reintroduction program is, is centered around uh, stocking streams with very young fish, emerging fry. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, the fisheries division had a, a Arctic grayling reintroduction effort uh, that basically didn't work very well. We were stocking fall fingerlings, so fish that were three or four inches up to yearlings that were seven or eight inches. Um, and once they were stocked and we tried to track where they went, they just disappeared. They never produced a fishery, but in the time from the early 80s to uh, about a decade ago, uh, some of the agencies out west have started stocking uh, fry. Basically, the, the fish are, the eggs are reared in the stream that they're going to be released into. The eggs hatch, the fry swim out of the incubator into the stream. And the thought is that that early imprinting with grayling happens at that stage. So there's, there's some precedent for that. Uh, we know sturgeon imprint at a very young age uh, differently than, than trout and salmon do. And so it, it appears like grayling might, might need that exposure to their, to their stream at a very young age. So when Montana started doing this uh, in Wyoming, 
uh, about a decade ago, they started having some real success where they weren't really having you know, success uh, prior to that. Some of the work out west and what people have observed is that grayling, they don't compete very well at all against brown trout. But there's really very little data to compare how brown trout compete with grayling versus how brook trout compete with grayling because we have both of those in many of our streams. And so we have some work going on with a doctoral student at Michigan State University, um, Nicole Watson, and her advisor there is Dan Hayes, and I'm, I've been working with them um, some to look at predation on the basically the grayling fry by small age one brown trout and, and uh, brook trout and to see how much how heavily those fish uh, might prey on, on grayling and compare one species to the other. But so far the results indicate that brown trout prey on grayling um, heavier than, than uh, brook trout and even the young of the year brown trout. Um, when you put a young brown trout in, this, in a creek in this experiment with a little grayling that big, they really inhibit grayling growth and survival uh, from some of the experiments we've done. So based on the results of that research, we're going to be able to, um, we'll come up with a way to look at the densities of brook trout in the stream reach and brown trout and then the different sizes of brooks and browns and we'll uh, estimate given the densities and sizes of the resident trout how much of an impediment they might be uh, from a predation or competition end to um, survival of young grayling. We got the habitat end of it kind of worked out, we're working on the biological end and then we're going to put those two pieces together and then have a kind of an overall rating for streams and then we'll apply that and then see how different stream sections that are nominated end up ranking out. In the end of September, the Badenoch Great Lakes Sport Fishermen Volunteers, aided by Escanaba Boy Scout Troop 411, release 5,000 fingerling walleyes into the waters of Little Badenoch. What we're doing here today is a culmination of a lot of efforts over quite a bit of time. Uh, what we're doing today is we are harvesting uh, fall fingerling walleyes that uh, we started early this spring uh, with very microscopic three-day-old uh, fry, which are about the size of mosquito larvae. We are here to help pull in the fish that they have set out and put them in the lake right behind you and in front of me. And the way we're going to do that is some people like me are going to be in these waders and some people are going to be on the boat we're going out and pulling in nets that are over across the pond. Well, back in May, we planted fry from the Lake Tribe here. We, we got uh, 50, 60,000 from them, um, fry. Raised them to, with yeast and fed them with phytoplankton, zooplankton. Checked the levels every week for like eight weeks out here in this pond and we netted them in 1st of July, um, spring fingerlings. So today the scouts are taking walleye out of this stock pond behind me and releasing them into Little Bay Dinoc of uh, Lake Michigan. And what we do is we go with the boat and there's, I'd guess, 20 nets set around the pond. Pull up the nets, dump them in a tank, bring them to shore, they sort them out and then they lease them out into the lake. Uh, we got about 25,000 out of here in July, uh, and that was purposely to remove some of the fish because we never know survival. Uh, we had fairly decent survival, and we knew that we could not afford to feed all those fish in the pond. So we had to remove some. Uh, wonderfully, uh, we got two and a half inch fry, or fingerlings out of here in July. Uh, we ended up getting 25,000 out of here in July and then we left uh, the rest of them in here to grow. Those walleye, when they get to that two inch range, they, they transition from plankton and zooplankton and such, they need meat. And what the form of food that we provide for them is fathead minnows. Um, we have a project with the fathead minnows uh, down in the other pond and we, we raised them down there from last year. We netted some out this year, put them in this pond to feed our fall fingerlings to make them grow to a larger size than, than previous that we've done. Um, we've never fed our fall fingerlings before. This year's the first year. Hopefully we'll get the you know, six, seven, eight inch walleye out of here. We would be satisfied if we had four to five inch walleyes. Um, it's difficult to tell because they're pretty evasive even at a small age. Um, it would be awesome if we had them larger than that. 
Uh, we don't know, but we will find out. Um, seven inches are certainly possible. Um, it will be a hallelujah if we got them that big. The survivability rate of a two and a half inch to a six or eight inch walleye, like a two and a half, you only got like a 3% survival rate. Um, a six to eight inch, you have up in the, upwards of 20 to 30% survival rate. So the larger you can grow them. 9.6. You get them in the water and the, where they're going, the better chance they have to survive and more of them. 9.3. This one's pretty active. 8.6. 8.6. Here's, here's a sibling that's right at four inches. Same age. Try to put a little, shed a light, a little bit of light on the growth rate of these walleyes and such. And uh, we've seen some, hopefully, some tremendous growth this year. Uh, the fish that we put in today are going to be next year opener. They're going to be in that 10, 12 inch range and the year after that, they're going to be in the 15s. Uh, uh, so that is when they're legal size. Uh, one thing I need to point out, and everybody has a tendency to have two different schools of thought on it, you catch that 30-inch walleye, um, think about how old that fish is. You know, there's an awful lot that goes into that. Depends on the body of water they're in, uh, how much food they've had, how much stress, how much competition. But it's not unreasonable uh, to think that a 30 inch fish could be 20 years old. And if you're going to catch it and put it on the wall, that's one thing. If you're gonna catch it and eat it, you're better off for the propagation of the species to let that fish go. And I would much rather, from a flavor standpoint and keeping the species going, release those larger fish, keep the 15 to 18 to 19 inch fish let, and eat those let the bigger ones go because those are the breeders. Those are the ones that produce uh, the fishery that we have today. And part of the reason we're doing what we're doing here is that hasn't always been followed real well. The fishery is depleted and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, the ultimate goal would be get the population high enough of breeding males and females so that there's natural reproduction that takes place so we don't have to work quite so hard to do this. But uh, in, in the absence of that, uh, as sportsmen, as people that are concerned in the community, we've decided that we're going to pull up our sleeves and get it done. So that's what we're doing. And this is what we call invasives. Uh, predators that come in and that can greatly affect the productivity of the pond. On that northeast corner, there's a lot of evidence where water came over and fish blew in with it. And if you can imagine, even that sucker, perch will eat walleye fry like nobody's business. Well, they're doing a fall walleye harvest here and we plan to do the same thing next year. We've been doing spring walleyes over at the east end since 2013 and we're not getting the results that we like so we're switching to fall walleyes starting in 2021 so I'm here to learn about what the success that these guys are having. Going great. Uh, we've got great public support. Uh, got to thank all the parties involved that help us pull this off uh, from the Sioux tribe to the Hannibal tribe to the community, Verso helping us with the food. Um, we're, our efforts are here to bring the bay back. These 5,000 walleyes represent a culmination of efforts by a variety of groups, including the Beatty Knox Sport Fishermen, Mole Lake Fisheries, Darren Kramer and the Michigan DNR, the Hannibal Community, Wildlife Unlimited of Delta County. A wealth of volunteers and landowner Gary Eichhorn who made it all possible. We're trying to get you know more people involved in the outdoors. We're trying to bring more kids in you know and to get kids interested in fishing they have to catch fish. So that's what this is all about. You know it's a resource and we want to expand on it. I just want to mention a little comment a commercial fisherman told me a few years back that have to work at taking just the cream off the top of the lake and always working from the bottom up restocking it. Uh, that's how his ancestors brought him up and if we do that working together we'll have fish for everybody in the community and everybody that uses the resource for a long long time. With adequate funding and committed volunteers the club hopes to raise the numbers to at least 40,000 spring fingerlings and 10,000 fall fingerlings in 2021. The opportunity to see where 
community is helping to preserve the walleye population and to make sure that there's plenty more for future generations. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.